Martin Mayer is a professor at the University of Vector in Germany and has done stacks of research into people's motivations for training. So Martin, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing very well. I'm not a professor yet, but I'm trying to get <laughs> to, to be one. Okay. And what's the University of Vector like? Is it a, is it a big place or is it a small town? Or? Oh no, it's like the, the most little university in uh, Germany at all. Uh, so we only have teacher training. Um, that's because uh, this is my uh, major. So I, uh, I started as a teacher because mm -hmm. before I um, went into to martial arts research. So we only have the teacher training here in uh, Fechter. Yes, it's very, very, very calm, very, very rural. Uh, we had a conference here pre-corona last year uh, this, um, from KUK, um, martial arts in Germany. Yeah. It's also very... Small. But so it's a small place, but you have been quite in integral and instrumental in the in the work of the German uh, Martial Arts and Combat Sports uh, Commission, and you were because you you have the, the the commission the DVS and you is it like like Kampfkunst and Kampfsport or something and it's a it's a yes. it's a formally recognised association that I guess is kind of funded and has a membership and you have annual conferences and publications and that's been going for what, 10 years or so now? Oh yes, we are um, nine years. So next year we will have our 10 year celebration and uh, next year Peter Kuhn will do the conference in Bayreuth again to, to memorize or to, to celebrate this. Okay, so that's a, that's, that's a big deal. And you were, the, you were a president or a, you were the, the director of that for a while? Yeah, for two years. Um, after Peter Kuhn, that is for four years. Um, then it was me for two years, and then um, Mario Stella, and then Sven Körner now. Yes. And the, the first time I met you was in a conference, uh, and you were talking about uh, how you adapted your martial arts uh, training to, um, to being a bouncer. Yes. And you, you were primarily a karateka, so you, you said you wanted to kick. Uh, that was your like initial reaction to to a conflict situation, but there were too many chairs and people and things, so you had to kind of <laughs> yeah. And the the ground was slippery, so it doesn't work to to kick in uh, doing <laughs> doing uh, playing a doorman. So yeah, it's a funny thing, idea. isn't it? I used to be I used to be a doorman as well when I was younger, and it's really actually not good that we're trained and our first reaction is to hit to lash out when really what we our first reaction should be to grab and remove to remove them and we charge in and we want to kick them. It's like, we're just as bad. So, so was that your first uh, research in martial arts or, or what was your first academic research in the field? Uh, my first academic research was the topic we are talking about now or we're talking about that today is um, motives. Uh, why do people train martial arts? And when I... Um, when I did my dissertation, so um, at first I didn't know what would, will be the main topic of the dissertation. So, uh, yeah, because 10 years ago, when I started with this, there weren't the martial arts studies network, uh, there, was the, there wasn't the um, German network. So the structural research about martial arts wasn't there at the time. And it's 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, it's great to see that uh, research field emerging and getting more interesting, more interesting, and so many people uh, doing research about this. This is fascinating. And um, yeah, but 10 years ago, there wasn't so much. So I did um, a research about participation mm. motive um, in martial arts, or especially in karate. Mm. So you, d you mainly, well, I guess, what were your research methods? Was it mainly questionnaires or interviews or, or theory or textual analysis, what was your main approach? Um, well, the main approach was grounded theory, so uh, doing interviews. And I interviewed uh, 32 people in Germany and in 2017. So um, when I finished my study, um, the, the results were quite um, spreading into the martial arts community in Germany. And there were some follow-up studies, sub-studies. So Peter Kuhn made uh, another study about uh, Tai Chi, from, participation motives in Tai Chi and, of, and Karate again, but with a more uh, diverse um, survey. So he interviewed 1,000, I think, or he did a, a questionnaire with 1,000 
people. Then we had Mario Stalla and Sven Körner, you know, mm -hmm. who did uh, a sub-study about uh, Krav Maga and Wing Chun. And uh, Sebastian Liebel and Sigrid Hub, uh, who did a sub-study about Judo. So uh, now we have for Germany, I think, a broad image about participation motives in martial arts. So we saw that um, from martial arts to martial arts, there are some differences in the motives. Uh, and in 2017, uh, I did with Heiko Bittmann, who is from German descent. He's a professor in uh, Kanazawa, Japan. Uh, we did a, a study about uh, Japanese people doing karate and doing judo. Okay. So what would be the main headline? So you've mainly, you've mainly studied uh, karate. So would that be Shotokan or any style of, of, of karate? It was just like any karateka, any style. What are your motives for, mm -hmm. for beginning? Um, uh, hmm? Yeah, yeah, no, you, I mean, you tell me, <laughs> tell me about that. <laughs> so in, in Germany, um, I, uh, the survey was about Shotokan, yeah. so a non-contact karate, which is a non-contact style. And when I went to Japan, it was full contact, Kyokushinkai. So this is mainly because um, I started kickboxing um, and doing a little bit of MMA, as you, you are started to. So um, that's also very interesting. And... Yeah, that's why I uh, participated in a Kyokushin Kai um, um, style uh, club in Kanazawa. So this was a, a university club. So the people were, were young, but the positive thing was, or one of the uh, positive thing was that um, the people couldn't, could speak English, yeah. of course. Um, that, uh, I, I can't speak Japanese. So my professor helped me with the interviews, doing the interviews. Yeah. And this was very, very nice. So in your experience then, in terms of the, your, your training experience and in terms of your formal research, what are the, are there real similarities in why Japanese would begin Shotokan or Kyokushinkai Shinkai and, and why, and, and German people, or are there, are there overlaps? What are the similarities and differences? Mm -hmm. There are uh, some overlaps, which also um, uh, match some motives of the people in this, in your podcast that said that uh, especially, I uh, make some notices. So, uh, Mark Duffert, who said that Elvis started to to show his toughness. Uh, he started karate to show his toughness to prove himself and maybe to to um, to let us some steam. These are also motives which are interesting or which are um, important for karateka mm -hmm. um, also. And Martin Minarik said in the last episode of your podcast uh, in, about Taekwondo uh, that performance, the technical performance or the theater, uh, theater likeness uh, is very important. This is also an, uh, um, a motive which is very important for karate cow when they're doing forms yeah. to, to show performance. Um, you said um, about uh, your BJJ training that there are some people who do this only for fitness reasons or for health reasons. And this is also a very important uh, motive branch. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you also mentioned that for you, it is some kind of habit or some kind of uh, necessity to, to train. Yeah, this is another yeah. important uh, motive. So there are lots. So we measured uh, around 50 different motives. Okay. I mean, some, a, a lot of people start training when they're really young and their parents take them and they have to question like, exactly how much uh, uh, how much involvement they had in their decision to begin something so you know when you get these really young black belts maybe it was just their dad wanted them to go or or their mother just took them because it was convenient and it seemed like fun so at that stage you have to ask do do these really high level adult players do they really have a motivation that 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 drove them or did it all just come because their family put them into that context? This is a very, very good question. So the social support for starting karate is um, in Japan and in Germany, it's very, very high. So uh, many people were brought into karate through their parents, as you said. Many people were brought into their friends um, and sometimes even uh, co-workers. Uh, yes, so this is, so I think, the main reason for um, people starting karate. And the thing is that um, um, we are talking, we talked um, recently about why did some martial arts emerge in special uh, decades. Mm -hmm. the, so karate in the 80s or kung fu in the 70s and so on, so on, so on. That is uh, mainly uh, 
pushed by um, media, so mm. or like movie stars. And um, the interesting thing is that um, the style they see in TV and the, which make the motive grow to learn martial arts mm. uh, hasn't anything to do with the martial art they actually learn. So people <laughs> see Bruce Lee and they say, hey, I want to learn karate. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, and so on. This so that, that, that's really interesting, and I I wonder, I wonder if the uptake of of karate will re, will will return because of things like co well social distancing and Cobra Kai, because I mean he, on Facebook one of my my friends on there yeah, exactly, <laughs> I had I had a Cobra Kai T-shirt many years ago, so I was into this before it was fashionable, but. So for instance, my um, my BJJ instructor on Facebook, he watched Cobra Kai and he wrote like, I've never wanted to study karate more than I do now. <laughs> and it's <Wow>. like, well, <laughs> but if BJJ becomes uh, untenable because of because it's so close and so much breathing and, uh, and sweat, then maybe the, we maybe we'll enter a time of, of an increase in solo training martial arts. So kata forms, patterns anything at a distance. Maybe we will see a media-driven and COVID-19 related like transformation in what people want to do. People won't want to do BJJ anymore. Like parents might be reluctant to send their children to, to BJJ classes because it's so proximate and so intimate. What do you think? Ah, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Because I mean, I guess what you're saying is in the 70s, we had we had the Kung Fu craze, but it still drove people to do karate. That exactly, that's exactly what happened in my life as well. Like I wanted to do Kung Fu and you're looking around, well, where is Kung Fu? There's Judo <laughs> and there's, there's karate. So we did that. And then, um, and then in the, I guess in the nineties, it was the UFC had a big effect. Yeah, in Germany, it was later in the 90s, uh, it was Taekwondo, I think, in Germany, and the UFC came in of the 2000s with uh, Wing Chun, or a little bit later as Wing Chun, so maybe in the middle of the 2000s. So the popularity of Wing Chun is a kind of 2000-ish? Yes, I would say so, yes. Is that just because of availability of instructors, or is it driven by demand, or, I mean, what is it that generates that kind of explosion in popularity? Yeah, you know the key figure, Kenspecht, um, who was head of the uh, European Wing Chun organization. And I think this was a late 90s and early 2000s. So I think it's uh, due to him yeah. and his effort to, to spread Wing Chun. Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to, to learn. It's this classic thing. I wanted to learn Kung Fu when I was a child. There was only karate, okay? And then there was Taekwondo, and I did Taekwondo. And, and then I wanted to learn Wing Chun and the only thing I could find was a Tai Chi instructor. So, <laughs> so, so that's what I did because Wing Chun was so scarce in Britain. It was, you know, if you, you know, in, in the early two, right at the start of 2000, 2001, things like this, you Google Wing Chun and you have to go to London or maybe Bristol or a big city, you know, maybe Liverpool. So you, big city, there was no local regional Wing mm. Chun. It was very, very rare. It's quite common now. I think you can get Wing Chun in lots of places across the UK, but it was so rare. Yes, this is also a thing for many people starting martial arts. So when people say, I, I want to be like Jackie Chan or I want to be like Bruce Lee, um, they only have one martial arts style or martial arts club uh, in the nearby. So they have to do karate or they have to do Wing Chun or so because it's the only club there. So it's not... Um, doing a specific martial art, it's only, okay, I want to do a martial arts. So like you, they start Tai Chi or something else. Yeah. So it's uh, a bit randomly. <laughs> yeah. yes. People just like, I guess they like the idea, martial art, I want to do martial arts. What can I possibly find? Yes. I mean, I always recommend to people, if when they ask about what their children or themselves, I say, well, what is convenient? Like really what is sustainable through the winter when you come in from work and you're tired, you're not going to get in your car or on a train and tra travel for an hour to the, to the specialist club that you fantasize about, but you might walk into town uh, or walk into the village or something and do the, yeah, see people do compromise, don't they? I mean, that's, that's the only way to, to go, I guess. Is there in Britain also a, some kind of um, social difference? Because in, in Germany, it seems like I don't have any study data or so, uh, but uh, that Polish and Russian people uh, from Polish or Russian descent uh, train more MMA and people from with our 
Turkish background, uh, train more um, Taekwondo and Karate. So is there also a difference in the UK about this? That's interesting. I've never thought about it in terms like that, in terms of, a, of maybe an ethnic uh, division of, of practices. I've thought about it in terms of class, and I've thought about it in terms of like the metropolis versus, versus a more mm -hmm. um, rural kind of area. Um, and I think that in, in terms of gender as well, I've thought about it. And, and I think that certain practices are really um, gender organized. But I don't, that would be a really interesting study to find out. I guess you, you would get clubs and teachers that would attract um, an ethnic, uh, or a certain ethnic or linguistic group. For instance, up the, not far from my house, um, there is a jiu-jitsu club that does seem to be heavily, it's not a Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's a, it's a Japanese jiu-jitsu style, but most of the people, and certainly most of the adults involved, are Polish. But oh, I guess yes. that's maybe just the instructor was Polish and his friends went and their kids go. So maybe it's just like a, a one of those kind of fact as well. They, they'll speak Polish and we know them, so we go there. I don't really maybe, know. What... Maybe it's not coincidental. So um, as you know, that in uh, the um, East European states or like Russia, wrestling is a huge thing, like uh, from the, or a huge tradition like beer wrestling or sambo and so on. And th this is maybe the reason why the people from there are so engaged in doing um, yeah, brawling styles or MMA, BJJ yeah. wrestling. I guess, I mean, if I were to speculate, I would think that maybe in a sense it's culturally overdetermined because let's say, let's say you have Polish um, immigrants and they're from this wrestling or judo culture then maybe for a long time that that will be the tendency. Whereas if you have maybe uh, uh, immigrants from India or somewhere and they're at the moment, that culture is really interested in kicking and Taekwondo. And so I guess it would be overdetermined in that sense, but I, it would be really interesting to start to ask questions about the ethnic makeup of, of different practices at certain times and to pose questions about why. What did you find in terms of ethnicity in the German context or the Japanese context? Mm, in the German context, it was interesting um, in the way that um, people starting or people engaging in karate say often in, in German, they love the discipline, they love the order. So this is uh, something that Kath Woodward say also for uh, boxing too. So the clear, clear um, environment of martial arts. And uh, this is another topic um, uh, which is interesting to to research the on the one hand the violence and the chaos of martial arts and the other thing the the drive for um, rules for order and so on so on this is also conflicting but it's yeah it's it's really interesting um, for for Japan uh, for the Japanese it was um, remarkable that some Japanese said that uh, they didn't have a connection to karate or to to uh, Japanese martial arts at all, but when they met foreign people, foreign tourists, or they went into, uh, they traveled around the world, many people said to them, oh, you're Japanese, you are sure you can do karate? And they said, no, I, I don't do karate. Yeah, why not? So, and this was the reason for them to start karate, because uh, they said, okay, in the foreign countries, um, it, karate and judo are um, are regarded as a traditional Japanese heritage. So I have to, to make a connection to this cultural model, what I would say. Mm -hmm. And this reminded me of the um, work of Oleg Banish about Japan castles. Uh, and um, he said the same. So you know that in the feudal era, many Japan castles were burned down or were scrapped. And when foreign tourists came into Japan, they said, oh, these are great castles, you have to to yeah. preserve them. And from the point of that, the Japanese people said, okay, this is really, really a worthwhile cultural element. And the same, the same um, goes for karate, I think, uh, and other martial arts, especially yeah. Yaido, Judo, Jodo. Mm. No, I think that's in, there's so much to talk about with that. I mean, um, it's funny because uh, uh, someone I interviewed hasn't been broadcast yet, but by the time this goes out, it will conversation with a, 
an Australian film, film and gender studies academic called Jane Park, and it would have probably been published before this one. Um, and, and she is from um, Korea, and she sort of felt ambivalent about taking up martial arts because she felt like she was becoming a stereotype of, of, of herself, like a caricature. Of, but but uh, it's interesting the way that uh, you take, like a practice can, in few, you can identify with a with a culture because of a practice or you might choose a practice and it gives you a newfound kind of respect for that culture so for instance um i always my preference was always for asian martial arts like i, I always had to, i really was all my in, first love was chinese martial arts but then and i also i used to really disdain european martial arts like Bartitsu and, and Savat and Lacan and, and these kind of, but, but as I got more into weapons-based styles, I found a newfound respect for, for, the, for the European styles of martial arts. And it does have effects on your values, on what you identify with and the, the, what you respect. I mean, it does change your outlook on, say, your own culture, your own history. Um, when you start to respect or appreciate the martial art of that of that culture, right? It it has a yes. an an intangible but definite influence on your outlook and your values, right? Yeah, you you're find, totally right. Yes, yes. Does I mean, what else did you find in terms of people's value changes or or or, or things like that? Um, so, from a cultural perspective, many many Germans um, developed. Um, yeah, um, an an interest for for Japanese culture or Asian culture to to deal with. It. Some people already had it or a cultural connection or cultural interest for for the Asian um, Asian atmosphere. But uh, people develop it also over karate and vice versa. So many Japanese people said they are more interested in Japanese culture by doing karate or the other way around. So they had a um, interest for Japanese culture and are doing karate too to embolt this or to, to deepen into this kind of matter. Mm. So it's, you're totally right. So it has a strong cultural um, influence. Mm. Have you seen um, the new Netflix film, uh, Enola Holmes? No, I, not yet. It's so it's, it's interesting because it, I think it's part of a, of a, I mean, I think in, in Britain, or for British culture, I think the Victorian era has always been a huge export, you know, that kind of Sherlock Holmes type dignified gentleman kind of character. But I think that now that it's moving into a kind of feminist reevaluation. So in Enola Holmes, it's all about the suffragettes and jujitsu and jujitsu training. And, and, and so it's a kind of incredibly politically correct film. It's a pity you haven't seen it yet, because, but I think it's part and parcel of that. Of, of, of that revision of, of what it was to be British uh, in Victorian times. And I do think that it will have a, um, an impact on how many people want to study classical jiu-jitsu or bartitsu or things that were popular in the early, like late 1800s, early 1900s in Britain. I mean, what do you think about that kind of process? I guess that maybe fell outside of your, of your scope, but what do you think? Yeah, indeed, a bit on the sort of study um, in my studies, it wasn't a, such a big issue, but um, I would say you're right that um, doing martial arts, especially in historical times, uh, was a key element to, for uh, emancipation purposes. So mm -hmm. um, super jets, as you, as you said, and um, yes. So which were the, um other big categories of motivation that you had you had you, you talked about there was health there was self-defense performance i guess there's stuff about being disciplined and, and 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 stuff about values what kind of categories did you find for motivations that are really large or, or, or in japan and in, in germany mm -hmm. so um a very very um diverging motive was um to become stronger so um we didn't have this motive in the German studies to become stronger, only maybe from a physical um, viewpoint. So I want to gain more muscles or so. Um, but my sensei in Japan, Heiko Bittmann said, let's get this category into the questionnaire for the Japanese people to become stronger. And I said, what is become stronger? 
-hmm. And uh, when I asked the Japanese people, so I trained with them like Louis Wakong um, in his famous study. So uh, I own, not only um, interviewed people in Japan, but also um, trained with them half a year. And uh, then I asked them, what is becoming stronger for you? And they said that it's not only a physical um, matter, it's also a cycle or psychic mm -hmm. matter to become mentally stronger. And I said, why? Japan is safe. You don't have to, to fight at all. Like in Germany, many, many, many people say uh, that they started training because of self-defense. It's the main reason in Germany. And um, this was not at all the case in, in Japan. And they said they want to become stronger because the work life is so hard and uh, civilian life, sometimes it's so exhausting mm -hmm. and they need more resilience, physical resilience and uh, uh, mental resilience to do that. And this is uh, one thing they are training karate for is to get more resilience, so mm -hmm. to become tougher. And do people's motivations change over time or was did you factor that into your study the, the like so maybe the, you've been training for 12 months maybe you have an answer to that question i know why i come to this club but after after 12 years i mean are people going for the same reasons or does that change mm -hmm. yes before i like to answer this question what do you think or you have um or you're participating in many martial arts you have uh, all great background of martial arts so how does the motives changed in your own history your own biography um in my own biography well i i guess when i was younger it was probably a desire to um i didn't i wanted to not feel scared it's like it's like six vetzler says you know it's like maybe martial arts are coping strategies for i mean put in simple terms I, you know i've spent so long punching punch bags I wonder who I should have punched when I was a child that would have just made that not necessary. But I, cause I do think that, that it was a psychological and sociological thing. Cause I was surrounded by, I mean, hardness and toughness were, were really champion values in, in my life and in my society when I grew up. And I think I was just scared. I didn't want to fight. I hated it. But I, and for me to be a martial artist sent out a message to the world Oh, that guy is a martial artist, right? It's like you know, it's it, it's it's that that kind of diplomacy. It's like don't mess with him, even though no one knew whether I was any good or not. Um, but as I got older, and and especially when you get to like middle age, and you get you have a professional job, and you have a house and a mortgage, and I no longer really really have a clear knowledge. I just know that I have to because I, it's, it's like it is me it's most of my life now like uh, in lockdown I, I, like or even before lockdown i had different existential crises like who are, what's the why do i even do this why am i going training like I, what do i and that's when i switched actually i switched to, to brazilian jiu-jitsu because i'd done so much hitting things and i was like i don't want to hit things anymore but it turns out i still do because lockdown no brazilian jiu-jitsu and i bought some new punch bags and it's like, I love it. This is me. This is me. But it's not about violence anymore. It's just about, it's, it's, it's something that I need. And I don't know. So if you asked if I would ruin your study, because I would have to fall into the don't know category. Like, I don't know why I do this anymore. I don't know why it's still important to me. I just know that it gives me a sense of um, a physical, like I feel my body and I can use my body. I'm not a dancer, I'm not a, an athlete, but this is the way that I know how to use my body and therefore I get a satisfaction from, from using it. I mean, what would you say after all these, after all these years of training? What, if someone said to you, why do you go training? What would your answer be? Uh, this is also, uh, this is tricky. This is a tricky question for, for everyone of us uh, doing martial arts. Um, I started as many, many people in Germany because of uh, self-defense. It was not necessary, but I, this was the reason I started when I was 15. Mm -hmm. and, and I started Shotokan and you know, it's without contact. So um, in competition, sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a good alert. That's a good ringtone. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so um, then I, um, yes, I did a Shotokan and the time now when I'm in my, my 30s and 40s, um, I love doing kickboxing, so I need the, the 
contact. I need the full contact. And this is also a moral question. So you know that Alex Shannon uh, said that fight, love fighting and hating violence. But for my part, um, the violence is a huge part of it. I, I need this. I don't want or uh, I love doing Yaido in, in Japan, so sword throwing. And sometimes I, I love doing Tai Chi, but I'm not regularly doing it. Uh, but the more thing I, I need, really need, is doing impact. Uh, the sandbag or with people, and this is a, a moral disaster I have to, to cope with. So that's not easy to, to deal with this. So I need this. So when you, you know that when you're talking with other people about this and you say, yeah, I, I like fighting, I like uh, doing punches, punch out the person and so on and kicking. Um, it's always people look like, oh, okay, he's, he's crazy. Um, this yeah, is I, I, the, I, one of the reasons I wanted to change and stop doing, um, I stopped doing Eskrima and I, I wanted to start doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was because my flinch response, you know when you get afraid? My flinch response was very <clears throat> it was <clears throat> and, and, and that doesn't work well in a domestic situation when your children want to give you a fright or your, or, or, or your wife comes up and puts her hand. That, so I was like, I can't, this is a terrible flinch response to have. I, <laughs> and I genuinely wanted rid of it. I wanted to get rid of that flinch response because like it's not relevant to my life. It's not, it's not, it's not pertinent at all. But yeah, at different times. So like I, I when I started to do a screamer, it was because I'd lost, when I started Eskrima, I lost faith in everything that I'd done before because all the other martial arts were really friendly. They were sport, they were, they were stylish, like, you know, like Taekwondo, kickboxing, um, and the Kung Fu was all very genteel and very polite. And, 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 a, and, and I thought I was meant to be good. I was meant to be a proper martial artist. And I went to the Eskrima club and every single person beat me. And I hated every moment of it. Like it was the worst humiliation I'd ever had. And they did it on purpose, you know, to, to beat me up. But, um, but I kept going back there, not because I liked it. I used to dread it. I used to start feeling physically sick two days before the class. And, and all day of that class, I'd be like, well, should I eat something? Should I not eat something? And I hated every minute of it for about two years. Oh. And, and I stuck with it for, I don't know, seven, eight years or something. Um, because for me, that my motivation at that point was, uh, I have to put myself through this challenge. I guess some people want to climb a mountain to prove something to themselves. And what I wanted to prove was, I really can deal with really, really tough training. And then after a while, I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, many motivations. I guess I use martial arts to test different aspects of my, my life. Mm -hmm. um, but enough about me, more about, more about you and your studies. <laughs> yeah, you brought a motive up, which is also very important for many, many people doing martial arts is like to, to prove oneself, to endure training, mm. to like, like Elvis did, like to, um, to prove um, their toughness mm. and um, to become some kind of invincible, um, mm. to, to endure beating up. Um, yeah, mm. this is also very interesting. Um, but you also do, um, you, you've done other work recently, which is really interesting. So you've, you've, you've recently written an article that we're going to publish in the journal Martial Arts Studies on the kind of ideological issue and political and, and, and racial issues around sumo. Mm -hmm. You've nice. also done studies of um, fights in ice hockey. Uh, and martial arts. I mean, what you have a really broad range of interests, <laughs> right? I mean, the sumo article is fabulous because I, you know, I, I know this because I've been editing it and uh, and working through it and everything. Uh, tell tell us tell us more about your interest in sumo. Where did you get the idea to do that big historical study of sumo? Mm. So the other time in, in Germany, when in German TV um, they broadcasted every sumo um, competition. Mm -hmm. So many people developed an interest or an amateur interest for, for sumo there. And uh, every time I'm in Japan, I am visiting um, uh, a sumo uh, basho, a sumo competition, and it's, um, the atmosphere is marvelous. So it's very interesting. And uh, also, you, uh, it's easy to come into contact with other Japanese watching sumo because they are so, so uh, light and they are so, um, I would say, 
so and enjoying mm. watching sumo and this is yeah from a hysterical stereotypical viewpoint it's not so japanese so mm -hmm. to engage mm. physically and uh chanting and so on and singing um in a sumo competition but uh, it's interesting to watch the japanese there and uh, you said thank you for the um compliment that the range is very broad because um, I think that martial arts is such a vibrating and emerging field and there are so many things going on and so many new people are going into this field um, due to the conferences we did in uh, the US uh, like in Orange which was a big great great conference or oh, this year the, the online conference was great so there are so many new issues um, we can do research and this is the main motivation for me to to go also a little bit broader to see martial arts from like some kind of different perspectives mm -hmm. like uh, on the uh, on the on the verge of the field so doing ice hockey doing sumo um yeah. doing uh or working at the doorman working as a bouncer mm -hmm. Hmm. so i guess i mean the, the the thing that we we talked about before we started recording was the 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 impact of covid19 the pandemic and we were t talking about how you're in a you're in a high alert state where you are at the moment it's like the second wave appears to be sweeping through germany and the second wave is sweeping through the uk and it's like we maybe we hoped this would be over soon and we hoped that we would get back to to full contact training and stuff but i, I guess as people start to think this is a long haul now maybe this is this is a change forever what effect do you think that will have on participation in martial arts? I mean, will things, what do you think the motivations uh, will become or will we just lose new people or will we lose existing people from practice? What do you think might happen? Yeah, in the talk we did um, pre-recording, you said that you believe that um, um, resting martial arts um, would suffer from the corona um, crisis because you know that people want to stay away from each other and so on. Um, yeah, this is, I think, um, one of the main effects. But on the other hand, we, we talked a lot about the um, necessity of a bodily yeah, need to, to do something like sports for catharsis or um, as a counterweight for staying always at home. So maybe this is the reason uh, that many people more engage in martial arts, mm. um, especially non-contact martial arts uh, or performative martial arts like Yaido, where you have uh, a lot of space because mm. you're wielding your sword and so on, or maybe uh, doing karate also, doing performances, doing forms as in Taekwondo. Uh, maybe this is uh, one of the outcomings of this corona crisis that this kind of traditional martial arts maybe gain more interest but I don't know. What, what do you think? Well, I think, I think certainly, I mean, I think that you can, you can buy a punch bag and you can go on YouTube and you can, you can learn how to box. Well, you don't know what it's like to be hit back, but you can, you can get a boxing workout. I think things that were popular in the nineties, like Thai bowl, remember the kind yes. of, <laughs> that kind of thing, like Billy Blanks. I think, I think that's the era we're in now with like people buying correspondence courses in, in yoga, maybe in Tai Chi. Also the crazy thing is, is in arts that people said, you cannot, you cannot learn this over a screen. But yet, like the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu clubs and associations are giving these things away to try and keep people engaged. I think, and this I guess is another question about motivations, because um, when, when I started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it was such a profoundly different practice that I started to keep a journal and keep uh, about my thoughts and feelings and everything. And people would talk about the, the motivations for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as health, fitness, competition, or to get a black belt or, or something like that. But it was obvious that so much more takes place in that situation. Like you have these boundaries of masculinity that are trans, like physical distances. So, so a lot of martial arts, especially the hitting martial arts are quite heteronormative in the sense that men stay at a distance and they test how tough they are. But in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and grappling styles, you get intimate with people, like with their whole body. 
And it's all sorts of issues you have to face up to, claustrophobia, homophobia, uh, all sorts of issues. And I think that there's some intent, and also things that happen with your nervous system and your, your, your sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. I think that people need these things that they can't express in words easily. Like, what is it about the club that is addictive and I don't think it's about, I want to be fit and lose weight, because you can do that by running and doing press-ups. Uh, uh, you know, you, but it's, it's, it's the certain, it's the je ne sais quoi, it's the extra thing that I think people will search for that and they'll find it uh, maybe elsewhere, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that I'm hoping to get back to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the spring. That's, in my head, I've gone, okay, I had to stop in March, hopefully in March, that, that's my kind of fantasy. But I think that it's people's, the motivation isn't necessarily for the martial art, it's for something, it's for, to get something. And I think people at the moment are looking, well, where the hell can I get this fix, this hit, this therapeutic explosion of, 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 of satisfaction? And I, I think, I don't know, I, I think that I don't know. I just think that it'll fragment. I think people will find things elsewhere. Like I can do Tai Chi. I can train on the punch bag. I can do, you know, meditation and breathing stuff. And I'm thinking maybe I'm getting everything I needed. I'm enjoying not being injured all the time. What do you think? <laughs> uh, this is a tough question. Um, it is. It's a research question, isn't it? Yes. Yes. We need to be doing the studies now. We need to be, I mean, I'm trying, <laughs> yes. I, I am, I, I try to clip and keep and record every article that seems that it, it's about a transformation because we're possibly going through an, a, like an epochal transformation, like a, a, a profound transformation in the status of media screens like this uh, and the, the, the place of, of socially distanced uh, um, relations and, and technology in our lives. So we need to be, working out research yes. projects right now right now we have to do the question <laughs> for for our networks yes because this is the time yeah. not only about your, your uh, what you said that um it's about physical contact what we are missing or maybe the impact tactics we are missing so one of the motives too is um to overcome anxieties yeah. many people start training martial arts to overcome the anxieties going outside and this is especially um, urgent and in, in, in corona times so yeah. when people are developing more and more anxieties yeah. so uh, and i think the coping strategies you said it it's a, it's a key function of martial yeah. arts in these days and maybe we have to do a research about that so mm -hmm. maybe martial artists um have better coping strategies with uh, staying at home with the corona situation uh, like non-martial artists because they they always work on the anxieties. Mm. Well, I don't, I mean, f for me personally, I mean, it was a huge uh, crisis to, to think, well, the, I'm so invested in this stuff and I can't do any of it anymore, apart from what I can do at home, that I didn't want to do anything. I, for a long time, I did nothing to do with martial arts. I did weightlifting and I did yoga. But then a lot of my anxieties came back. You know, the start of lockdown was in April, May, June. It was anxiety everywhere. And I wasn't able to lose my anxieties because I think that when you go out and you subject yourself to stresses and the thrills of, of, of training, then that's, that, has a, that has chemical effects on your brain and psychological effects on you and emotional effects. And I was looking around for a long time to find ways that I could turn off the anxiety again just generalized anxiety. I mean, I have found some techniques which uh, are related to meditation and breathing and stuff that I think give me the same chemical hormonal hits as, <laughs> as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, to turn the stress on, turn it back off again, to, to make the system work properly. Um, but I think it's, I think maybe, I, I wonder if martial arts have been thrown into even more crisis than other people because or well, maybe like maybe rugby players, maybe you know people who can't make these. They need this physical contact, and it's taken away from them. I don't. That would be a study as well. Yes. Yeah. So what I know about the NFL football in America, so many players said that they need it. So also yeah. physical contact, the the collision. So I think this is very similar to to martial arts. One of my coping strategies was when uh, in the time when there weren't any fitness studios open up and I was sitting at home all the day and gaining weight all the time um, to do virtual martial arts. So uh, I had a virtual reality um, 
equipment for the PlayStation. And yeah. there are two games which I played every day, every day for an hour to, to cope. And this one was uh, Beat Saber. So you're wielding uh, virtual Beat Sabers, uh, Sabers. And the other thing was a Creed we are so boxing against rocky and boxing and so this was very interesting so you're standing in front of the screen all this boxing and doing thing and it was exhausting and was sweating all the time so it did it every day and for yeah two or three months so wow uh, virtual virtual martial arts is also a very interesting uh, study object i think i think you're right you know i think that we were on the verge of constructing a, a massive research project here <laughs> great, great, cool. <laughs> I, I think there is something in this, but I think we've talked for maybe almost an hour, and I think that's, oh, that's as long as I, I could ever hope for from listeners or viewers. So I think that um, we should continue these conversations, but maybe um, maybe not on this particular episode of, of this particular podcast. So yeah, great. I'll just say, uh, Martin, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, to talk to me. It was really, really interesting. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for your invitation. It was really, really, really cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.